When doing Bayesian analysis using samples from an MC-MC algorithm, a very important aspect of your analysis needs to be determining whether your MC-MC algorithm has converged to its stationary distribution. So in other words, are we actually drawing samples from our target distribution, which is generally some sort of joint posterior distribution? So there actually have been many different ways that people have come up with diagnosing whether the MCMC algorithm has converged to the stationary distribution, whether we've obtained enough samples from the stationary distribution to accurately estimate the posterior distribution or quantities of interest. And so we'll be looking at the, some of those shortly. One of the things we've talked about with MCMC algorithms is that the starting values can be influential when you first start the chain. And so in order to compare chains in such a way that the starting values doesn't make a huge, diff, uh, huge impact in our analysis, oftentimes we discard part of each chain as some sort of burn-in or warm-up period. And it really depends on who you talk to about how much you should do. There are some people who say you shouldn't discard any samples from your MCMC chain, that you should use them all because they are valid samples from the posterior distribution, even if they are unlikely. Other people say that you should discard, say, half of your chain and consider that to be a warm-up period. It really depends on who you're going to talk to. In this class, just to be safe, we're going to discard half of each chain as being warm-up, though you might change that depending on the context. So one very basic method of diagnosing whether your MCMC chain has converged to your target distribution is to look at a trace plot of your sampled parameter values. And so essentially what you do is you look at a time series plot of your sampled parameter values versus the iteration or cycle number that the parameter value was sampled. You generally do this separately for each parameter. So if you have multiple chains, which you really should, uh, you would oftentimes plot the chains in one plot. So you would plot one chain and then you use a different color and plot the same chain. And what you really want to see is you want to see the chains converging to the same distribution. You also want to see that the chains move around quite a bit as we move along the x-axis. And this is a very unscientific term or very vague term, but really you want the time series plot to look pretty wiggly. So we basically we want to be exploring our parameter space uh, pretty well. So here is an example of where we have two chains that are plotted uh, in the same trace plot. So you can see that we have the sampled value on the y-axis. We have the iteration number on the x-axis. And some aspects of this plot show good things going on. Some of them show bad things. So if we look at the wiggliness of the trace plot of each of these time series, it actually looks pretty good. So we're moving around quite a bit in our algorithm, which is positive, so we're exploring our parameter space. But we have one chain that uh, is in this upper portion right here, another chain that's in, the, that's in this lower portion down here, and they do not appear that they have converged to the same distribution. And so looking at this, this would be a clear indication that we have not, in fact, converged to our stationary distribution. Oftentimes your plots are not going to be this wiggly, at least when you look on this small scale, so maybe a thousand iterations. So here's a plot right here of a different change that I, that I ran over a thousand iterations. It actually wasn't, a, it's not a terrible chain. It's, uh, there's some, definitely some correlation, but you can see that we're sticking quite a bit more. And so uh, over a certain number of iterations, we're actually keeping the same value. Then we move, we keep the same value, etc. And so we're not moving as well as we might like uh, in this particular chain, but this too isn't too terrible because at least we are moving with reasonable frequency. So here's another example of a bad chain, we or a bad MCMC algorithm, where we have not yet converged to the stationary distribution. So we see one chain that is converging downward, we see another chain converging upward. Honestly, if I saw this, I would think that perhaps I made an error in programming up my MCMC algorithm. Uh, but if you did, in fact, program it correctly, this would be an indication that you have not yet converged to the stationary distribution. So a package in R that's very convenient for uh, implementing, or I should say, applying diagnostic tools to your MCMC output is the CODA R package. And there's a number of func functions that we're going to look at uh, in the next set of slides and some examples here.
So effective sample size is one of them. Autocore.plot is a plot of autocorrelation among the sample values in the chains. You can look at the cross variable correlations if you want, though this is less frequently done. Uh, you have the GWIKI diagnostic, the Gelman diagnostics, the Heidel diagnostic, and the Raftery diagnostic. These are four different diagnostic tests that people have developed to assess whether the chains have converged or whether we have sampled enough values in our chain to do accurate posterior analysis. So the autocorrelation plots is sort of another basic way to diagnose how effective our MC, MC algorithm is drawing samples from the target distribution. And we know that since we are implementing a Markov chain Monte Carlo method, that our values are going to be correlated in some sense from iteration to iteration. However, we want that to be at a minimum because the less correlation there is or the less dependence there are between the samples in each iteration, the essentially the more information that we have about our target distribution from the sample that we've obtained. And so a simple way of analyzing how much information we have how well our chain is doing in sampling approximately independent realizations from our target distribution is to construct autocorrelation plots for each of the sampled parameter values. And so the idea is that you take one of the parameters, the sampled values for that parameter, and you construct an autocorrelation plot, which essentially compares how correlated are the residuals as a function of lag or distance between the sampled values. And ideally, you would want the autocorrelation to drop relatively quickly. So as you look at this plot, it's going to start off at 1, and then it's going to drop. You want to see that drop quicker or more sooner rather than later. And if you have an autocorrelation plot that doesn't drop or barely drops at all, that's really a bad indication. And essentially, it means that you have a very inefficient MCMC -MC algorithm that you have implemented. So... This is an autocorrelation plot for the same chain that we saw, that we looked at in the, the previous plot. So we're actually using the same data here. And so in this case, essentially what we see is that up to about lag 10, there's correlation between the sampled values. So roughly speaking, every 10th observation is going to be independent uh, of each other. So if we have one observation and then we sample 10 values in our chain, the 10th, the 10th, the iteration that's 10 steps later is going to be approximately independent of where we started. This is actually not a super high correlation. Uh, a lot of times you see chains that have a much longer tail, which is not what we want. Um, ideally, we would see this drop off even faster, maybe have a lag three or lag four, uh, but this is actually not terrible in practice in my personal experience. So the effective sample size is the, roughly speaking, the estimated number of independent observations our sample is equivalent to. So we've already mentioned that the sample that we obtain has correlated, is a correlated sample. The observations, the sampled values are correlated with one another. And so the effective sample size is essentially trying to ask the question, how many, so if we had say 10,000 samples in our MCMC -MC change chain, how many independent samples from the target distribution is our sample equivalent to? And what you really want to see is you want your effective sample size to be close to the actual number of cycles or iterations that were implemented in your MCMC chain. So if we, if we sampled 10,000 iterations in our chain, we'd hope the effective sample size would be something close to that. If we sample 10,000 values in our chain and we got an effective sample size of 50, it means that even though we sampled 10,000 values in our MCMC chain, that only corresponds to about 50 observations if they were sampled independently from the target distribution. So that would not be a good case. We definitely don't want to see that. So just in general, the larger the effective sample size is, the better. So one of the most popular diagnostics for diagnosing whether our MCMC chains have converged to the target distribution is the Gelman-Rubin Gelman statistic. And this was proposed in 1992. And I'm only gonna, going to describe this at a very high level. So essentially what you do is you run multiple chains in your, of your MCMC algorithm. And so you have different starting values, you try to over disperse them in your parameter space. And then what, you, what this algorithm does is it compares the different chains. And informally, what it does is, is it tries to diagnose whether the chains have forgotten their initial values, which would essentially mean that they have converged to some sort of stationary distribution. And so uh, a little bit more specifically, it compares 
the within chain variability to the between chain variability. So how much do we how much variability do we get within a chain and how much do the chains vary between each other? And if uh, we essentially don't have a lot of between chain variability compared to the within chain variability, that's a sign that we have converged to our stationary distribution. This test or this diagnostic actually assumes that our target distribution is normal, which means that depending on your parameter, it might be helpful to look at a transformation of that parameter so that this statistic is more meaningful. And in general, values of r hat, which is the notation that's used for the convergence statistic, if those the values of r hat are near one, that suggests convergence. And so when we do our gelman rubin diagnostic, essentially what we want to see is we want to see r hat close to one. And we'll see later on that in practice, r will give us the r hat value. It will also give, her an, give us an upper limit of r hat. And as long as that's pretty close to one, then we think that we've probably converged to the stationary distribution. The Heidelberg-Welch diagnostic is another tool that we can use to determine whether our MCMC -MC chain has converged to its stationary distribution. And in addition, this diagnostic also tells us whether we have run our chain for long enough. So the first part of the Heidelberg-Welch diagnostic is assessing whether our chain has in fact converged to its stationary distribution. The test performed by this diagnostic is based on the Kramer von Mises statistic. And what it does is it looks firstly at the whole chain and decides whether the entire chain comes from the same stationary distribution. If that test is failed, then it lops off the first 10% of the chain and checks whether the remaining 90% uh, has converged, whether it's from the stationary distribution. If that fails, then we remove 20%, and we keep doing that until we get down to 50% of the chain. And if the last 50% of the chain has not converged to its stationary distribution, then we have failed the convergence test. However, if we pass the test, then this test will tell you how many iterations you should keep. Uh, in other words, which part has converged to the stationary distribution or not. If we pass the stationary test, then we can move on to what is known as the half width test, which essentially is trying to assess whether we can estimate the mean with some desired level of accuracy. And so what this test does is, so what the half width test does is, is it looks at the ratio of the margin of error for a confidence interval of the mean, and it compares it to the estimated mean. And so compare, so we're looking at at constructing a confidence interval for the posterior mean of a parameter of interest. We compute the margin of error, which is just one half of our confidence interval for the mean. We compare that half width to the estimated mean. We look at that ratio. And if this is less than some value epsilon, which by default in R is set to be 0.1, then we have passed the half width test. If this ratio is more than epsilon, then the chain should be extended because we cannot estimate the mean within the desired level of accuracy. So let's look at some R code just to see what we're, we can expect to see when we are doing the Heidelberg and the Welch test, Heidelberger and Welch convergence test. And so in this case, we actually are looking at a test of two parameters. So there's variable one and variable two. And it looks like in this case that the stationarity test for variable one passed uh, and actually it, the whole chain passed. We didn't actually lop off any of the values. And then also variable two passed the stationarity test. And so that's good news. And now we move on to the half width test. And we see that for variable one, the half width test was passed. And the half width was 0 0.00108, so a pretty small value. Uh, compared to the mean, which is 1.81, the ratio of the half width so the half width divided by the mean is a very small number. It's going to be much less than epsilon, which is by default set to be 0.1. For the second variable, which in this case is actually a variance parameter, the estimated mean of that parameter is roughly 0.09. The half width, the margin of error for our associated confidence interval of the mean, is 0.1. And so if I take the ratio of the half width to the mean, I get a number that's actually a little bit more than 1 which is definitely not going to be less than epsilon, which is by default set to be 0.1. And so if we want to estimate the posterior mean of the second variable, we probably should extend the length of our MCMC -MC chains.
Another diagnostic that people use to assess whether, really to, to assess whether we have run our MCMC algorithm for long enough is the raft diagnostic. And so essentially what this does is it asks the question, if we want to estimate a certain quantile Q with some level of precision R, and we want to make sure that our estimate is within uh, that accuracy for that quantile with some probability P, how long do I need to run the chain? Uh, this test also will give us this estimate I, which is a measure of how dependent the sample values in the chain are. And in general, we want the values of I to be less than 5. So values of I larger than 5 is an indication that you have more correlation in your chain. And if there's more autocorrelation in your chain, you're probably going to need to run it longer. So by default, this function in R tries to estimate the 0.025 quantile. The accuracy is 0.005, and we want to attain that level of accuracy with probability of 0.95. So you can change these numbers if you want uh, within the function, though we're just going to leave the default. And at least in this chain, for this particular chain, it tells us that we want to remove 17. The first 17 observations should be removed. The, in order to achieve this level of accuracy, we actually should sample 100, or sorry, 18,408 iterations from our chain. This number right here is if we had values that were not correlated, how many values would we need to sample from the target distribution independently in order to get this level of precision. So it's about uh, 3,800 or so. And so obviously we need to have quite a few more than that. And the dependence factor I here is a little bit less than 5, which is encouraging. Uh, but there's definitely still some dependence, and because of that, we need to run our chain longer to achieve uh, this level of precision than if we had independent sample from the chain. The last diagnostic that we are going to look at is the GWIKI diag diagnostic. And the GWIKI diagnostic essentially is trying to compare the estimate of the mean in the first part of the, the, the chain to the latter part of the chain. And you can decide exactly how big those are. The default is that we compare the first 10% of the chain to the last 50% of the chain, and we're trying to attest for a quality of the mean in those two portions of our chain. And so if they come from the same stationary distribution, the two means should be equal. Asymptotically, the test statistic has a standard normal distribution. And so this test is actually going to produce a test statistic. And if the test is passed, then the value should be between negative 2 and positive 2. And so if we look at some R output here, uh, we can see here the fraction, so how much of the chain we use, so what portion of the chain we used. So we used the first 10% and the last 50% by default. We compared the means of those two samples, and we wanted to test whether those means were equal. Our test statistic is 1.025, so this is definitely with, between negative 2 and positive 2. And so the Kiwiki diagnostic would say that this particular chain has, in fact, converged to its target distribution.